We did it. We have reached the start of college football season. Welcome into the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. I again and Matt Barry. Cannot wait to talk ball with you guys throughout the college football season. We had week zero. Week zero was great. It, it was a little bit of an appetizer to the full entree of what we're getting here Labor Day weekend and week one. We've got a big week one preview show today. We're going to get into the backyard brawl, Pitt versus West Virginia. First time they've played it in 11 years. Lewis Riddick is going to join us to talk all things backyard brawl. Cannot wait to catch up with him. So we'll get to that one. I do want to touch on Scott Frost and Nebraska coming out of week zero in their loss to Northwestern. It appears that at least for the next couple of weeks, Things are not going to be going the way of Scott Frost and Lincoln, Nebraska. So we'll get to all of that. But I do want to talk about some of the big week one games. And, I, and I, well, look, we say it every year. We say that this is the best week one ever. We said it last year. I know we did because I said it on Sports Center. I said it on College Football Saturday. But you'd be hard pressed to find, here we go again, a better week one than we have this year. If you look at the game starting Thursday with the backyard brawl and then Saturday, for instance, Oregon and Georgia. To me, this game is fascinating. You've got Dan Lanning, new head coach at Oregon, takes over from Mario Cristobal, who left down to Miami. But the recruiting was there for Cristobal. He brought in a ton of talent. So Coach Lanning is walking into a very talented situation. But he also brings in Bo Nix from Auburn to be his starting quarterback. Why is that important? Because Bo Nix knows what it's like to play against Georgia and SEC schools. And then you've got Georgia. Defending national champions, Stetson Bennett is back from walk-on to national champion to Sports Illustrated cover boy. It's really been a remarkable story for Stetson Bennett, but it will be intriguing to me. I know Georgia's ranked in the top three as they should be, the defending national champions, and they've done a great job, Kirby Smart, in recruiting. But they lost a lot on defense. I believe seven of the 11 starters from that unit a year ago are off to the NFL. We're going to get a really good indication really good indication early on is Georgia, which I don't think they will. 2019 LSU came out of nowhere. One of the best college football teams in history wins the national championship. They have fallen back a little bit. I don't know that Georgia is that, but it will be intriguing to me to see the recruiting that Kirby smarts done over the past couple of seasons. And is this a little bit of a rebuild or is it a reload? Because you'll get it indication right away. Oregon comes in talented, new head coach, an experienced SEC quarterback in Bo Nix. Really good opportunity for both schools. Pac-12 to get some national recognition. And Georgia, Georgia to kind of plant their flag and say, hey, you know what? I know we're the defending national champions, and you're going to have to contend with us again this year. The next game I want to hit on, Cincinnati and Arkansas. Cincinnati was one of those schools a year ago that played football for the quote unquote little guy in the group of five program that had never been invited to the college football playoff and going in, listen, going into the season, we knew that with the schedule, Cincinnati played Indiana, they played Notre Dame. We kind of knew that that along with a pretty decent schedule on the American, that if Cincinnati handled their business, they could in fact crash the college football playoff party. And they did Desmond Ritter, He's now in the NFL. Sauce Gardner, now in the NFL. Luke Fickle built a program to do exactly that. National attention, crash the college football playoff party. So what do they do for an encore? We talk about this all the time in sports. Are you a one-hit wonder, or are you someone that can put out an album with numerous hits? I think Luke Fickle's done a great job at recruiting. They're headed to the Big 12 in a couple of years. I think Cincinnati is going to be one of those programs year in and year out that has national success. This is a really, really good matchup for them because Arkansas, under Sam Pittman, he's one of those coaches that you can't help but root for. Comes back to Arkansas a couple of years ago. Offensive line coach, big fella, loves football. He looks like what an Arkansas coach should be. With zero expectations, by the way. And all he's done is step-by-step, little-by-little, built Wu Pig into a legitimate team that could in the SEC West cause people problems. KJ Jefferson is back. We've heard him compared to Cam Newton. There are expectations that Arkansas is going to take that next step this year. So you've got last year's feel good story in Cincinnati 
against this year's really, let's call it feel good program and what they're building there in Fayetteville. Keep an eye on Cincinnati, Arkansas. It's not getting the attention. It's not as sexy as Ohio State, Notre Dame. I get that. But this is one of those games, if you want to watch good football and see where Cincinnati is a year after a playoff berth and see where the growth of Arkansas is a year later, check out Cincinnati, Arkansas. That's going to be a fun game to watch. So another game that, to me, there isn't a game, I believe, in week one where the reputation of a conference, an entire conference, is at stake. And that is Utah and Florida. And I'll tell you why. Because it's, it's not a secret. Pac-12 is down. It's been down. They haven't had a college football playoff participant. They had Oregon. They had Washington. We haven't seen it since. People believe, that most believe, that, that Utah – is the team that can get the Pac-12 into the playoff discussion. Cam Rising's back at quarterback. They won the conference a year ago in that historic Rose Bowl loss to Ohio State. But Utah's the team. They cannot go to the swamp and lose if the Pac-12 wants any opportunity of being in the playoff. And it's not going to be easy. Utah comes in ranked seventh. I know Florida comes in unranked. But Florida's got a lot of optimism around new head coach Billy Napier. Napier's got the quarterback and Anthony Richardson. The swamp is one of the toughest places to play in the entire country. If the PAC 12 wants to talk playoff, if people want to ignore the fact that that conference isn't good, Utah has to go to Gainesville, hang a W and prove to everyone that looks at the PAC 12 as an afterthought, especially with USC and UCLA set to leave the league. This is a big one for Utah and a big one for West coast football because they can kind of carry the flag and the banner in Billy Napier's debut at Florida, because I know a lot of people are excited about that one. That's a good one on ESPN, Utah and Florida. And now the biggest one, Saturday night, primetime, ABC, Notre Dame, Ohio State. This is two versus five. This is the Buckeyes returning the Heisman Trophy favorite and C.J. Stroud against everyone's favorite coach and Marcus Freeman. The reason this game, to me, is going to be one that you literally have to just sit and listen to Herbie and Fowler call this game because I don't believe anyone won the offseason more than Notre Dame and Marcus Freeman. He was the guy, the video of him went viral when he was announced as head coach. Everybody knows Brian Kelly left to go to Baton Rouge. And so Marcus Freeman, he's a young, energetic coach. He's been killing it on recruiting. But that's the offseason. Offseason is completely different. You can win the offseason. You can win the press conference. You can win the recruiting wars, but you got to win on Saturday. And there's so much feel good around Notre Dame. I almost worry that going to a place like Columbus, playing the Buckeyes, who, in my opinion, are probably this much behind Alabama as the best team in the country. There's concern for me if I'm Notre Dame that you've got all this goodwill nationally building up and then you go into Columbus, you got to take on Travion Henderson, Jackson Smith and Jigba, CJ Stroud and Ryan Day. I think Vegas has this. It's a double digit line. I've seen it at 14. I don't want to give incorrect lines. I just know that it's at least two touchdowns in favor of Ohio State. If Notre Dame can go in there and keep this game close, you have to really think about where Marcus Freeman has this program headed. We saw Brian Kelly take them to a playoff and fall up short. We saw Brian Kelly take them to a BCS national championship against Alabama. So we know they've got the ability to get there, but do they have the talent, the speed, and the type of athlete that can annually hang with Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, some of these bigger, faster SEC Southern schools? So watch this one only because it's two versus five week one traditional programs to the highest rating getters in all of college football. I expect Ohio state to win big, but Notre Dame, if they can carry that feel good story from the off season out of the field on Saturday, it could be a special season for Marcus Freeman in South Bend. And finally, before we look forward, which we've done in these game previews, I want to look back to week zero in Northwestern beating Nebraska 31 to 28. And the biggest problem now for Nebraska is this. Scott Frost continues to struggle. We know that. He came into the season three and nine. I thought with some of the transfer guys he had coming in, like Casey Thompson at quarterback, transfer portal running back, some defensive guys coming in, Mark Whipple, the offensive coordinator. I was one that bought into Nebraska. 
And they could still have a special season. But the biggest problem for Scott Frost coming out of that week zero loss is that that game and that onside kick decision, that was on national TV as the only show in town. Typically, with all due respect to Nebraska Northwestern, if that game's on noon this Saturday, there's a chance that it's buried on the Big Ten network or buried on a regional network that it might not. It could even be on ESPN at noon Eastern, but there's so many other games going on. But the fact that that onside kick decision, when you've got the momentum 28-17 was done in front of a national audience is the only show in town and people frothing at the mouth for college football, that to me is what makes this so damaging to Scott Frost because everyone saw who was watching college football what Nebraska fans have been talking about for the past couple of years. Again, it could get fixed. They got a couple of weeks to figure it out, knock off the jet lag and make everybody forget about what happened. But Scott Frost now, all of the goodwill of the offseason, similar to what I was just talking about with Marcus Freeman and kind of the feel-good story, can we rally behind one of our own? It's going to be an uphill climb for Scott Frost the west of the way. And I'll say this, Pat Fitzgerald, congratulations. They had an awful season a year ago. They were also three and nine. Pat Fitzgerald's not going to keep Northwestern down two years in a row. And at least through week one, that was the most Northwestern football game I've ever seen. But now for Scott Frost, what do you do in week two? How do you get your team to believe? To me, that's going to be the biggest storyline for the Cornhuskers. Can they throw out what happened, leave that over in Europe, come back stateside and get this thing going again? Because if not, the Scott Frost tenure is going to be over before you know it. All right, so I know people watching the week one preview here in the uh, college football YouTube channel think, well, wait a second, what about the backyard brawl? I'm giving the backyard brawl special attention this week because myself, the great Lewis Riddick, are going to be calling that game Thursday night, 7 p.m. Eastern ESPN. And, and Lewis is perfect for this because he experienced the game playing for Pitt. Mm. Lewis, as best as you can, like, we don't know what this rivalry is like. Take us oh. inside the lines of what the backyard brawl is all about. Well, during my time in Pittsburgh, obviously there were two rivalries. There's the one against Pitt. I mean, the one against West Virginia, the one against, and uh, the one against Penn State. You know, Penn State obviously is interstate. It's, you know, they're, I don't know, an hour, two hours away from us. And everyone knows the big history between those two. West Virginia is a little different. You know, it's 70 miles south of Pittsburgh. There's a lot of kids who go to West Virginia who are from the Pittsburgh area. It just seemed always in the four years I was at Pittsburgh to be nastier. It seemed to be more personal in terms of the people of West Virginia, I think, felt as though Pitt thought that they were superior. Many of the recruits who went to West Virginia felt as though Maybe Pitt snubbed them the same way in many ways, Matt, that the people at Pitt sometimes felt as though Penn State felt that they mm. were superior to us. Yeah. So it's kind of like the same thing. It's kind of like that same butting of heads. West Virginia always feels like they have something to prove, just like Pitt feels like it has something to prove to Penn State all the time. And that just breeds a lot of contempt, a lot of healthy sporting contempt. I'm not that's not to say that this could, you know, spill into like personal feelings, but I can <laughs> tell you this. From a sporting standpoint and from a slightly personal standpoint, I have never walked into a stadium as a player. And at the time, 18, 19, 20 years old, like I did in 1989 in Morgantown, and seen grown adults scream at me in the way in which these fans screamed at me and our and, and, and my teammates. Like they were saying some vile, vile things. <laughs> and this was it was a big time game. We were ranked 10th in the country at that time. They were ranked ninth. They had Major Harris, James Jett, uh, Reggie Rembert. They just had weapons all over the place. They had a great team. And we had a bunch of good players, too. We had Kervin Richards, Mark Spindler, uh, Keith Hamilton, um, Alex Van Pelt. We were loaded, too, as a football team. And I'll just tell you, in Morgantown that night, the atmosphere was one where the hair on the back of your ne neck, the hair on your arms would just stand up at just how tense it was and how personal it felt. And on top of that, that, you know, expectations were high for both teams. I feel like that is kind of what we're setting up for Thursday, especially from Pitt's perspective with how good this team could potentially be. And for West Virginia, they've got themselves a new gunslinger, a quarterback in JT Daniels. And I feel, look, every, every fan base feels as though 
their hopes raise exponentially. Sure. You have a quarterback. Yeah, and, and look, it's been 11 years. That, that's one of the big storylines coming in. It's been a better part of a decade or over a decade since we've seen this game. And so, Lewis, I, I wonder if the country – really understands when we kick off 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN, understands just how big of a game this is. Because typically, correct me if I'm wrong, no. this was always at the end of the year, was it not? Yeah, it was It was near, near the end of the year. Sometimes smack dab in the middle. I don't know how they really went about determining that. But um, for us, Penn State was always the final game before yeah. they went to the Big Ten. That was always the big one. But West Virginia was usually, you know, halfway to three quarters through the year because you knew it was going to be a big game. You knew that probably this was going to have back then big East ramifications as far as the standings were concerned and maybe even national ramifications, but for it to kick off the season, right? That, that, that makes it even better. And I'll tell you why. And you know, this expectations are so high for both Pitt and West Virginia, right? That we don't even know how good these teams are going to be. So there, there hasn't been any kind of letdown in terms of teams, maybe not fulfilling expectations. Like right now, optimism reigns supreme. Yeah. So for both teams, it's right out of the gate, man, we get to renew this robbery. Pitt's supposed to be a good team. West Virginia has a good quarterback, a bunch of transfers that come in, especially in the secondary, some guys on the defense side of the ball, they got big wide receivers returning offense. There's so many like things that lead both fan bases and both football teams to feel optimistic that I kind of like that. It's the first game of the year. I like that. It kicks it all off because like I said, everybody associated with this game for both universities feels as though we should win this game because there is no track record. There is no track record. That's right. We should win this game. That makes it all the more, all the more special, I believe. And look, and we were talking about it, getting ready for the game you, you bring up a great point. When you see the luminaries, they're mm-hmm. going to be on the sideline on Thursday mm-hmm. night, not just from Pittsburgh, but from West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Lewis, you get a really good indication of how much talent has walked <laughs> through this game, yourself included. Yeah, dude, look. Just starting with Pittsburgh. Look, you know, I'll start with West Virginia. I have a lot of respect for how they play and some of the players that they have produced out of there. OK, I know how good Major Harris was as a quarterback oh, yeah. in, the late, in the late 80s. I know how good James Jett was as a wide receiver because I played with him in, in Oakland and he was a legit game breaker. I know how good Reggie Rembert was. Eugene Napoleon was Chris Herring, the linebacker was Ronaldo Turnbull was a first round draft pick as a three, four defense, three, four outside linebacker defensive end. I know how good these guys were. Because they look. They gave it to us as well as they took it from us. So for all those guys to maybe be back at this football game in some form or fashion, whether it's live or, you know, at a watch party, whatever it is, that's huge. I have nothing but respect for them on the field. As far as my school, as far as Pitt is concerned, look, man, I would stack Pitt's all-time team up against any team in the history of college football. Between Marino, Dorsett, Hugh Green, Ricky Jackson, Carlton Williamson, Sal Sinceri, you know, Larry Fitzgerald, um, Darrell Reeves, Curtis Martin, on and on and on and on and on and on. These guys are all going to be there. They're all going to be there. These are some <laughs> great players, all pros, Hall of Famers, national championship winners in the case of Dorsett. I mean, these these guys are luminaries. Yeah, they are, they are the standard as far as pit football is concerned. And maybe And the standard – in many respects, as far as college football is concerned, it's a, like I'm getting texts from Hugh Green, man. And I, I all of a sudden, instead of being the 53 year old guy who now has established his own career, I turn into the little kid again. Right. Isn't that the and beauty of the sport, though? I turn into the little kid who, who remembers meeting Hugh Green in 1979 at Temple when Pitt was playing Temple and me sitting there going up to him with a piece of paper going, and, he, and Hugh at the time is maybe 19. Yeah. He going up going, Mr. Green, can I have your autograph? You know, <laughs> I still laugh at that stuff. It's amazing to me. But isn't that the great part about sports though, Matt, right? It it makes it. Us feel like children again. We're going to feel like that Thursday night. And that is the great, I, look, I cannot be one, any happier to be doing Thursday night football with you, but two, having this be our coming out party for this year, because it's the only show in town. College game day is going to be there. And I'll end it with this. I know what West Virginia people are thinking. Oh, Lewis went to Pitt. He's going to be, no, he's a professional. We're going to call go. this game. 
right there down the middle and let the final yeah. score dictate who gets talked about most. There is no question about that. I have probably, I've done, I've been racking my brain watching West Virginia tape because I want to do them justice because this team, this team is scary, man. I know. They've got some, they have got some absolute rear end kickers on the defensive line, big, strong wide receivers, new quarterback. And they're ticked off, and they always feel disrespected when it comes to Pitt. And Pitt has a lot of expectations, man. So, look, I will call it just as we see it, just as I know you will, and we'll have a lot of fun doing it. And um, I could not be more thrilled. We lucked out, bro. We got a great game to start it off. I'm just counting down the minutes. Can't wait to bring it to you 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. For Lewis Riddick, I'm Matt Barry. That concludes the Week 1 preview, and what a Week 1 it's going to be in college football. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.